Hello, everybody. I'm Cindy Braden, the SVP of Sales for Enzo Data. I want to thank you for joining us for another great web webinar today on Beyond Pressure, the History and Future of PAP Therapy. We're really excited to bring you our speaker today, Dr. Will William Noah. Dr. Noah grew up and did his medical training in Tennessee, but did his pulmonary fellowship at the University of Utah, where he was awarded a Parker B. Francis Research Fellowship. However, a family situation caused him to give up his research there and return to Tennessee and start a pulmonary sleep medicine practice in 1992. His sleep medicine practice known as Central Cent Cent ah, Sleep Centers of Middle Tennessee has grown into one of the largest in the US with 15,000 new referrals per year. Dr. Noah pioneered remote patient monitoring for sleep by requiring modems on all PAP patients beginning in 2006 and his three month, three -month adherence data helped later sway CMS to require adherence for reimbursement. More recently, Sleep Centers of Middle Tennessee collected long-term adherence data on 4,000 consecutive age match, sex match, race match patients starting PAP and found patients treated in an integrated sleep care model had nearly twice the average usage over the first year, 5.2 hours versus 2.7 hours than those treated in the traditional model. These results are published in the January 21 issue of JCSM. Dr. Noah, in 2020, received the Visionary Award for the ten from the Tennessee Public Health Association for developing a way to diagnose and treat patients with OSA across Tennessee and six neighboring states during COVID when other programs had to shut down. Now, Dr. Noah is the CEO of SleepRes, and at APSS in June, SleepRes introduced a revolutionary new device to improve PAP adherence by producing inspiratory flow comfort. It's called VCOM. Although he still oversees the care at sleep centers of Middle Tennessee, Dr. Noah rarely sees patients and spends most of his time in his large PAP research lab on his farm. It is there he developed several new technologies to improve PAP therapy, and SleepRes will soon release them. The VCOM is just the beginning. Um, but we are going to hand it off to Dr. Noah now, and thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to learning more about Beyond Pressure, the history and future of PAP therapy. Well, thank you, and thank InsoData for uh, inviting me to do this talk. Uh, we're going to talk about Beyond Pressure, and so we're going to talk a little about pressure to begin with, and kind of bear with me through some of the physics, because it's really not that hard, and it's going to get clinical real quick, but uh, you know, what we've found that really we're introducing uh, is that besides choosing a pressure for a patient with sleep disorder breathing, by learning to focus on the resistance and the flow in the system, we can improve comfort, uh, hopefully long-term adherence, and even safety. And just like, you know, as a pulmonologist, we manage every part of the ventilator in the ICU, we've sort of ignored the CPAP. We said, hey, just give them five to 20 and let them pick their own mask. And I'm not sure in the future that's going to be the best way. I think we can do a better job. So I'll share what I have and I look forward to your questions at the end. Wish we were live, it'd be much more interesting, but I'll try to make it live. So as far as conflicts of interest, well, I am the CEO of SleepRes and we just released VCOM and I'm going to be talking about VCOM at the end. So yes, I definitely have a conflict of interest here. So pressure, pressure is the force of the unit area. It's for a gas, it's the, it's the force of the gas on the walls of the container. It's the sum of all the collisions. I like to think of pressure as a bunch of little hands hitting the walls, you know, trying to force it open. And in the pharynx and the lung where we're applying pressure with CPAP, you know, I like to think of those molecules hitting that wall and stabilizing that airway as we breathe. Now, pressure gradient is what we really mean when we're talking about pressure. It's the force produced between two different places or locations. Obviously, we think about it in weather where you have a high pressure system and a low pressure system. And of course, that's what wind is. It's traveling from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. When I'm standing on the tee box hitting to a par three, the reason I feel that big wind in my face is the pressure is higher over the green than it is over the tee box. Now, more importantly, when we breathe, you know, we have to create a pressure gradient to get flow. Now the room out here is zero. We always say the room is zero. So if I need flow, my tidal volume, my breath to come in, I have to have negative pressure for zero pressure to flow into my lungs. 
Now to get the air back out, I have to generate positive pressure to have a gradient. It's interesting at sea level, the barometric pressure in centimeters of water is 1,034. You know, 20 centimeters of CPAP sounds like a lot, but it's really not a lot of increase over that amount. You know, you gotta think when you're standing on the beach and you're not even in the water, you have the weight of 34 feet of water on you uh, with normal barometric pressure. So pressure gradient in the system of the PAP circuit. So you're gonna see this a lot today. You see the fan over here to the left, the turbines which generate the pressure, which create flow, and then you're gonna see that we have a flow meter, which you know adds resistance. And we're, we're, we're gonna go through this a lot more later, but I want you to understand that there's a pressure gradient, that there's the room pressure that's zero, and then there's a pressure in the circuit. And let's say that pressure is 10. Well, then the gradient out the exhaust, where you know all the air blows on your bed part, you know, where all the CO2 and all the exhaled gas has to go, that gradient is determined by the pressure in here. So the higher the pressure, the more flow out the exhaust. There also has to be a gradient from the circuit into the lung in order to get air to go in there. So remember, without pressure, there's no flow. So what about for PAP therapy? You know, well, it's we say positive airway pressure, but it's really positive airway pressure gradient. To stabilize the pharyngeal airway, we have to have a higher pressure in the pharynx pushing out with those little hands of molecules in collisions than is pushing in. The second action that's often overlooked, and I found that the engineers I deal with, you know, really didn't understand this, most of them, that the second action that's almost as important, probably more important than obese patients, is that the positive pressure increases the volume of air in the lungs. And when you increase the volume of air in the lungs, you move the lung down and you pull on the trachea and you stiffen the pharyngeal walls. It's like pulling on both ends of a rubber tube. It makes it stiffer, so I'll show you right here. Like on this hose here, as I pull, it's harder to compress. All right, so this is called functional residual capacity. Now, functional residual capacity is hard to say, especially when you're congested, but take a breath in, everybody. All right, blow it out. All right, where your lung capacity is right now, that's functional residual capacity. It's where it is when you just exhaled a normal tidal breath, we call it. Uh, increased functional residual capacity is what separates CPAP from all other therapies for OSA, and we'll address that in just a minute. I want to quickly mention there's a third action that positive airway pressure does, and particularly for a nasal pillow or under the nose interface, that it creates a positive pressure gradient across the nose. In other words, if you look at Jessica here in the picture, now Jessica is our assistant clinical director at Sleep Centers of Middle Tennessee. You can see that because where the nasal pillow mask is, it doesn't cover the nose. So the pressure in the nose is greater than outside the nose, and therefore it decreases nasal resistance and improves nasal airflow. A nasal mask or a full face mask wouldn't do this because it covers the nose and there is the same pressure on each side, so there's no gradient to provide therapy for that. A big advantage for nasal pillow interface. All right, so we talked about two sites of actions for PAP therapy to treat sleep disorder breathing, particularly obstructive sleep apnea. Um, number one in the pharynx, you see the arrows going out, but that pressure is the little hands, the little collisions are, are pushing that airway open. We all know about that, what pressure they need. We talk about closing pressures and, and all those. And, and, and But the other thing is down the lungs, that that pressure is expanding the lungs and it's pushing the lung down and that's pulling on the trachea and creating stiffness in the walls. And that, that is very important. Of course, you see in the nasal passage, that third possible action. So PAP increases functional residual capacity, that, that amount of air in your lungs when you just exhale a normal breath. And of course, it pulls down on the trachea, stiffens the pharynx walls, and that's very important. Now, I want you to think about this. Therapies that do not increase FRC are much less effective. Think about oral appliances. Think about upper airway surgery, like a UP3. Think about the hypoglossal nerve stimulator, uh, Inspire. So they don't increase functional residual capacity, and therefore they're less effective, particularly with more obese patients. You see, with obese patients, particularly with abdominal obesity, it's pushing up instead of pulling down on the trachea. And so it's making the airway, the pharyngeal airway, more floppy. 
it decreases the stiffness. This is why gaining weight worsens LSA and losing weight helps. Now also when you gain weight early on, you increase the peritonsillar fat pad and push in from the posterior wall of the pharynx. But after a certain period of time, that kind of caps out and it's that abdominal pressure pushing up that continues to worsen. When you have patients on really high pressures, usually they're on, you know, they're usually they're obese and, and you're trying to increase that FRC. That's what's going on. That's why UP3s have uh, weight limits really after BMI 35, you shouldn't be doing it. And hypocausal nerve stimulators have sort of weight limits as well. Uh, so let's look at the early history of positive airway pressure therapy. Well, it actually started, the best I can tell, is in 1878 when Ortel used inspirations of compressed air to treat severe asthma, something we did more with expiratory air in, starting in the, in the late 80s. And then the first ventilator was George Fell when he used a foot bellows to ventilate an opioid or multiple opioid overdoses until they woke up basically and recovered. Uh, he combined with uh, Dr. O'Dwyer 10 years later called the Fell O'Dwyer ventilator, which was a, uh, George Fell's actually most well known because he invented the uh, electric chair. He was an engineer and a physician. Um, and then we move ahead to the 1930s and Alvin Barrick at New York University uh, really did tremendous research and they were using PAP to treat pulmonary edema. They were using a mouthpiece and a little face mask. Uh, wrote some incredible articles and really who knows what would have happened if he had continued in the field. We might have had uh, innovation back in the 30s and 40s that we didn't get later for 30 years. But he decides to go to Harvard and becomes interested in uh, psychotherapy and is actually most famous for having a couple of famous female patients. Uh, PAP really began to be used more commonly in the 70s and it was treat adult respiratory distress syndrome. But we all are interested in PAP from the 80s because in 81, Colin Sullivan's first article, the reversal of obstructive sleep apnea by continuous positive airway pressure through the nares. All right. So CPAP makes you breathe backwards. Sullivan said, initially, inspiration is facilitated and expiration is impeded. It's like breathing backwards. Normally, you know, you have to bring the air in, you have to create negative pressure and, and have the air flow in, and then you, you know, are passively against expiration. Well, inspiration is still active, but it's actively resisting the pressure. Without active resistance, the positive airway pressure would distend your normal lungs. If I uh, pharmacologically sedated and paralyzed you and put you on 15 or 20 centimeters of CPAP, well, it would just distend your lungs and hold them inflated. And CPAP also, from literature in the 70s, increases tidal volume and ventilation right off the bat. People can get uh, an adaptation to it to where they can learn to control their tidal volumes, but, but initially that's what it's going to do. It's trying to force more air in there. And these effects are worse with lower BMI because the lower your weight, the more compliant your chest wall. Heavy people have a less compliant chest wall, so the effect of the PAP increasing tidal volume is not near as much. It's interesting that treatment emergent central sleep apnea is more common with lower BMIs because they have more augmented tidal volume, most likely. And we'll talk about that later. So, you know, while expiration is more difficult on PAP because now it's not, you know, rest expiration is not passive, you have to actively, you know, exhale against the pressure. It's still the forced inspiration that's most offensive to new patients. You know, we've treated, we figured out over 100,000 patients in our 30 years, and uh, about 20% have problem with the expiratory part, which it can be quite bothersome, but it's that initial inspiratory part that is offensive to new patients. Question. All right, how do we do this? Uh, Cindy, uh, I'm, do they have a way to respond on their on their device? Yes, sir. So, okay. <laughs> Here we go. So, which of the following is true regarding resistance? Resistance reduces flow. Resistance reduces pressure. Resistance directly reduces both flow and pressure. You have Jeopardy music. I was so, thinking the same thing. We're at 20% vote. It looks like everybody is just getting rolling. So go ahead and make your selection and then I'll share the results. We'll give you like five more seconds. All right. So hard to cut, cut it off because I can see people are still, okay, we're getting close. 60%. All right, what do we have? 
what are our percentages? Uh, can you guys see that? So 36% said resistance reduces, 12% said reduces pressure, um, and 52% resistance directly reduces both flow and pressure. Okay, so 36% said flow, 12% uh, said pressure, and 52% and said flow and pressure. Yes. All right, well, good. I'm glad we're gonna cover this because the answer is the 12%, number two. Resistance reduces pressure. And this is, this is kind of hard for people to think through, but this is so important to understand the PAP circuit. So I'm really glad we're doing this. Uh, I knew there was value in it. So I have taught all our staff this because our staff, again, doesn't just think about pressure settings. We think about flow and resistance when we're setting up patients. I like to call pressure gradient flow and resistance the rock, paper, scissors of sleep medicine. So, you know, rock takes scissors, scissors takes paper, and of course, paper takes rock. Well, without a pressure gradient, there is no flow. Increasing the pressure gradient takes, I mean, increases flow. So, pressure takes flow. Without flow, there's no resistance. Increasing flow increases resistance. In a static situation where there's no flow, there's no resistance. And of course, resistance drops pressure. Now, I will say this, the, the third answer was a little tricky. It says drops both. I said directly drops both. If you have resistance, you can indirectly drop flow because as you drop pressure, you drop the flow, you drop the pressure gradient, which will drop the flow. But straight out, directly resistance drops pressure and that's so key to understanding the pap circuit all right so what is flow well flow is volume over time just think of it as number of molecules of the air over time and flow is measured it's volumetric in, in cpap so it's liters per minute just like the speedometer is miles per hour now this is very key and this will help you with the resistance flow part the law of conservation of mass so the same flow into a tube has to come out the other end. All right, so whatever Q flow, that's the engineer's term for Q being for flow, we use V dot, you know, which is the first time derivative of the volume. But uh, actually one of my engineers made this diagram for me, that's why it's got Q. But anyway, the, whatever goes into that tube has to come out the other side. I could add a million resistors in there, but whatever flow goes in has to come out. It's the law of conservation of mass. Now, the velocity may change. So for a large tube where you have more cross-sectional area, well, you could have a low velocity. But for a small tube where you have a lower cross-sectional area, you have to have high velocity. And this is really important in the CPAP circuit when you're dealing with a nasal pillow interface because you have those very little holes going in the nares. And so to get the flow through there, it's got to really increase the velocity. And that's what makes it uncomfortable for a lot of new patients but there's ways around that by understanding this. All right, so flow is also either turbulent or laminar. Laminar flow is, kind of, is you know, can't we all get along? <laughs> laminar flow is, is kind of like uh, not happy in America today. It's where everyone's moving in unison, going their own way, not bothering anyone else. And turbulent flow is when everyone's climbing over each other, trying to get down the tube before the next molecule. And uh, and why is that important? Well, it's important because turbulent flow is what's going on in a CPAP circuit. And the difference is the equation. So the linear line, the straight black line is laminar flow. And so the change in pressure or the pressure drop is equal to the flow times the resistance. All right, just like Ohm's law. But turbulent flow is the red line, it's parabolic. It's a second order equation. So the change in pressure, or the pressure drop will be by the square of the flow. Okay, so that means at low flow, see you don't get much pressure change, but at high flow, you, you get a lot of pressure change. So that's gonna be very important as we go through this today. Now, the way to understand a CPAP circuit, and this is a busy slide, but we'll talk about it in a minute, because it's so important, is that everything in the circuit is a resistor, everything. And what do resistors do again? resistors decrease pressure. So, you know, people think that a fan, like this blade over here, that we think that it generates flow. It does not generate flow, it generates pressure. And that pressure on those blades creates a gradient to create flow to go in one direction or the other. 
And so once that pressure comes off here, it's going to hit a flow meter. And that flow meter is hanging down, you know, to measure the flow. It's going to cause resistance. Therefore, you got a pressure drop. It's going to cross the humidifier. Another pressure drop, usually small. And then it's going to go down the hose. Well, the hose is just a resistor, a long one. And you can have a six-foot hose or you can have a 10-foot hose. The 10-foot hose has almost twice the resistance of the 10-foot hose. So the pressure is going to drop more. And then you could have a 22 millimeter hose, which is standard, which has very little pressure drop, but a 15 millimeter has considerable and a 12 has a ton of pressure drop. All right, well, then we get to the mask. Does the mask have a 15 millimeter hose and now some new ones coming out have a 10 millimeter hose? Well, that's gonna be more resistance. And then we get to the fact, what kind of mask? Well, a full face mask has really no resistance, so there's no pressure drop. A nasal mask has not much resistance. And the nasal pillow mass has tremendous resistance because those little holes, you know, where it comes to the nares. And that varies based on a small nasal pillow mass has much more resistance than a large. In fact, it's tremendously different. Uh, in fact, by going from a large to a small, you can drop the pressure in the circuit a couple centimeters of water with just not even thinking about it. At a higher flow, more than that. So all these things are important. Then you go to the manufacturer. Well, Phillips mass have more resistance than ResMed, Fisher Pikeale, and React Health Mass. They're all pretty similar. The Phillips has more resistance, particularly in their larger cushion. So, because they try to make all their cushions the same. But in other words, if you use a Phillips mask with a ResMed blower, you're gonna drop the pressure, okay? If you use a ResMed mask with a Phillips blower, they're gonna get higher pressure because those manufacturers want you to use their mask. And, you know, therefore they designed it for that particular resistance, which we're gonna talk more about. And all of it gets to be a mess, beginning unless someone's keeping track of, you know, which hose, which you can dial into the machine now, okay, which mask, but that's kind of limited, and we'll talk more about that. And, and the bottom line is the engineers only engineer to the face. So once you get to that interface there, you're done. Once the air comes out of the interface, it's done. So they don't even talk about the most important resistance in the host system, which is the nasal passage, particularly if they're congested. Because the pressure to the face is not therapy. It's not. That's, that's, so they're not delivering therapy, they're delivering a pressure to the face. The therapy's in the pharynx and in the lungs, as we talked about, and that's what's important. So what's happened over the years, and we'll say this again later, is we have sort of like, you know, with ventilators, we think through all this, but with CPAP masks, we don't, and we just say, hey, put her on five to 20 and let her pick a mask out. I don't care whichever one she wants. And that can have tremendous difference tremendous difference in pressure. You know, for instance, if you go from a, a from a nasal pillow mass, say you put them on nasal pillow mass in the in the lab, and then they go to the DME and the DME switches to a full face mask, well, you just drop two centimeters of pressure, all right? And then what if you didn't put them on EPR and then they do in the in the DME office? Well, yeah, you drop five centimeters of pressure. And, you know, is that gonna be therapeutic? Hopefully they're on, on APAP where, you know, it can counteract for that. So, the big kicker here is let's go back to our pressure flow curve of the turbulent flow. And what you'll see is at high pressure, you have big pressure drop. I mean, high flow, you have big pressure drop. And at low flow, you have low pressure drop. Well, how is that important? Well, when you're breathing in, you have high flow in the circuit because you've always got the exhaust flow, you know, blowing on their bed partner. That's always got to be there. The only way it drops is the pressure drops because it's based on a grading across the little holes. So you got that flow. Now, when you breathe in, you're getting the tidal volume coming as well. So, you know, you've got maximum flow. So because maximum flow, you're going to have a large pressure drop. So IPAPs reduced. All right. The inspiratory pressure. On exhalation, now you have low flow. All right. Because there's no patient flow, they're actually breathing out. And most of the exhaust flow is probably coming from the patient. So there's very little flow coming from the from the blower or very little circuit flow and little pressure drop. And so EPAPs usually preserved. Uh, this is an early study from 1986, an early CPAP. My friend Kingman Stroh, Dr. Stroh and Dr. Susan Redline, I think she was a fellow here. Um, so what's fascinating is, you know, is the precociousness of these two, you know, well-known investigators in our field. You know, I think Kingman was 10 and she was seven when they published this. Uh, I actually messaged her the other day on that and she laughed. Um, but this is an interesting case. It says nasal pressure, but it's really not. It's the pressure in the nasal mask is what they're measuring. And you see they had the CPAP on. They turned the CPAP off. They had three apneas, turned the CPAP back on, and their apneas were gone. And, you know, it shows that, you know, CPAP <laughs> treats sleep apnea. But what's interesting here is you see the pressure in the mask. So it's 14 on exhalation, and that's what they were kind of set at. But when they breathe in, 
look, that pressure on inspiration is dropping all the way down to seven or eight. Huge drop, okay? But look, they're still treated. So the inspiratory pressure may not be as important. I mean, think about that. You get this big pressure drop across you know, the circuit when they breathe in. Machines couldn't respond as fast. And of course, they didn't account for the different resistances in the system. And so when they breathe in, large flow, big pressure drop. All right, so what's the purpose of this? Well, the purpose is to kind of understand that EPAP is the therapy, not IPAP. Mahadevia back, you know, in 1983, right after Colin Sullivan, you know, showed that it was EPAP that reduced the frequency and severity of the respiratory events, not IPAP. Uh, and then the BiPAP came out in 1990 by Dr. Sanders uh, and Respironics and Jerry McGinnis. And, uh, and this is the first time you could do IPAP prayer to an EPAP. And it sort of got everyone's attention. And we'll come back to that. And kind of got us offline, uh, maybe. And then, of course, uh, Gugger showed that, and his group showed that CPAP created a larger cross-sectional area in the pharynx than BiPAP using CT. Morel at the bottom uh, Tavissier, they they showed that basically if you just stabilize the airway during exhalation, it really doesn't matter what the inspiratory pressure is. And they showed that, you know, about the three breaths before you have an obstruction, the expiratory airway begins to break down, begins to destabilize. And all you have to do is pressurize it. And there's an EPAP that everyone needs that's therapeutic for them in a particular position, particular stage of sleep, et cetera. So in fact, rest in them showed that IPAP had really no benefit in treating uh, airway obstruction. Um, so that it had to have EPAP with it. So EPAP is again, is a therapy, not IPAP. Of course, you remember when the Provent came out, the little resistors that were in the nose that had the little band-aids around, created expiratory resistance in the nares, which builds EPAP. Um, and of course, that's been shown that that increased pharyngeal opening, just like CPAP, increased functional residual capacity, and pharyngeal wall stiffness, just like CPAP, and it can be used to treat OSA and snoring. But realize there is no IPAP. The IPAP actually is negative. It's not positive. Now, my good friend Jeffrey Sleeper just reduced this uh, IPAP, nasal EPAP device on the right, uh, and then Dr. Saul Hakim, another friend, he just reduced this other device uh, on the left, and uh, you can find those online. But again, it's a little hard to get used to because you're going from negative pressure to positive pressure. Uh, I think CPAP's easier to wear and they're really made more for snoring and for people with uh, mild disease. Um, then continuing this thing about EPAP being the therapy, not IPAP, uh, Zoo et al showed in 2016 that the pressure relief features, you know, A-flex, C-flex, EPR, they just basically decrease efficacy. We just have to get it in our heads. When we drop EPAP, we are dropping therapy. EPAP is a therapy. EPAP is what stabilizes the airway. Uh, and you're dropping, you know, if you turn the pressures down, then you're dropping EPAP as well. You're, you're, you're dropping therapy if that's the EPAP that they need. The hypoglossal nerve stimulators, like the Inspire and the Nixoa device, okay, they fire during exhalation. The developers clearly understood that stabilizing the airway during exhalation was key to therapy. I mean, whether they're doing it with with a nerve stimulator or a pneumatic splint with a CPAP device, if we stable the airway during exhalation uh, with EPAP, it really doesn't matter what the IPAP is. EPAP is also the safety part with PAP therapy. Uh, the PAP circuit blower hose and mass has two real main objectives. They wanna provide therapy, of course, pharyngeal pressure and FRC increase, but you also gotta clear the CO2, the patient exhaust from the circuit. It's gotta get out somewhere. It's gotta get out through those holes or a mesh gun in the case of one couple masks. And so you've got to get it out of the circuit to, to prevent rebreathing. If you don't clear it out, the patient's going to breathe it in the next breath. So what does that? Well, it's EPAP. It's EPAP that clears CO2 from the circuit and protects us from rebreathing. If you lower the EPAP, then you decrease the exhaust flow during expiration, and then therefore you're going to increase the risk of rebreathing. IPAP provides little protection for rebreathing. So EPAP goes with safety. We're going to do another lecture here couple months and we're going to get into this in a lot more detail. <laughs> uh, so let's look at the history of PAP since 1990, starting with Dr. Sanders and Dr. Kern, uh, I mean Nancy Kern, with, uh, and Respironics when they introduced BiPAP. So what they did, they added a flow meter and a valve to a CPAP and they could then independently adjust the IPAP and the EPAP. 
And the thought was you could minimize ZPAP for comfort despite reducing therapy. Uh, and the thought at that point became, ah, all we do is we crack open the airway with EPAP to treat the apneas, and then we force it open with IPAP to treat hypopneas, rears, and snoring. And, you know, and it just caught on. It was great. The guidelines still today say that's how we do it. We raise the EPAP for apneas, we raise the IPAP for the others. And believe it, that's how my uh, staff have all done titration. That's how I believed until just a couple of years ago when I looked behind the curtain <laughs> and found all of this. So despite the the, I, uh, the the BiPAP coming out and kind of catching everyone's attention, you know, in 95, you know, and multiple other studies show that BiPAP really is no better than CPAP with adherence. But, you know, I, I, I it don't think it's anyone's fault, but the money was huge. I mean, you go from a $1,000 machine to a $3,000 machine because she can't tolerate it or he can't tolerate it. And uh, so this made large money for the manufacturers and it made large money for the, for the uh, equipment providers. And uh, it just may not have been the best choice. 2001, Ju has it all. They introduced proportional PAP where based on the flow rate, it goes up on inspiration, goes down on exhalation. It only changed the mean airway pressure by a centimeter and didn't make a lot of difference but it was the precursor to C-Flex. In 2003, the big thing happens. Respironics introduces C-Flex. Expiratory pressure release. Now it's flow-based. There's a flow-based release of expiratory pressure. As you, uh, ResMed later introduces EPR, which was just a simple pressure reduction. And CPAPs become basically bi-levels with the pressure support between one and three. Uh, the Cephem device out of France has four. But you know, at that point, now most all our PAP devices are BiPAPs, even though they're CPAPs. I still remember when, <laughs> I can remember where I was standing when the uh, ResMed rep, who's a really good guy, came to visit me in 03, he's now a regional uh, manager, and uh, was telling me how this, this, this C-Flex was not safe, that it was hurting efficacy. And you know, he was so right, <laughs> now I look back. but. But after ResMed came out with EPR two years later, I, ne I never heard that again. So, uh, and of course, Zoo et al. clearly show, like I mentioned earlier, that pressure relief features, they decrease efficacy. Well, now they really start stepping up the IPAP. All right. So 2010, Philips introduces, now it's Philips Respironics, okay, introduces the mass resistance setting where each cushion, you know, has a different resistance in it, particularly in the nasal pillow cushions. And they're labeled one through five, and you enter that into the machine. ResMed and other manufacturers quickly followed. They just basically have three settings, full face, nasal mask, and nasal pillow. So the engineers are really bright and really nice guys. I've gotten to meet tons of them over the last couple of years to the different companies. And they were told to maintain pressure delivery to the face all through inspiration. Do not let that pressure drop. Well, now they have flow meters, you know, in all the machines. And so they know when that flow goes up, that pressure is gonna drop more on inspiration, particularly over a nasal pillow cushion. It's gonna have large drops. So guess what they did? They go, well, we're not gonna let it drop. So they jack the pressures up even more. So when you breathe in and you have that nasal pillow setting on there, you're gonna get that jacked up pressure. So with that pressure, remember the law of conservation of mass, that flow has to go across that little opening. So you're gonna have what they call jetting or high velocity coming into the nasal mucosa and people don't like it. And then to make things even worse, you know, they developed more technology. I mean, they even made it better. I mean. I mean, it's amazing what the engineers did. I mean, around the same time, they came out with low inertia turbines. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, these low inertia turbines can change speeds quickly. And if they can increase the speed quick, they can, that's increasing the pressure almost instantaneously now. And so therefore, not only do they jack that pressure up, I mean, there's no hesitation. It's just right on. And, and they're able to almost do what you call a square wave which is really uncomfortable because boom, it goes right up and stays over and then comes down depending on the expiratory release program. So to summarize so far, the question is, um, odor may be better. <laughs> so, I mean, older CPAPs had lower IPAP, they are probably more comfortable. They had higher EPAP, you know, therefore therapy and safety. Newer CPAPs have higher IPAP and lower EPAP with EPR, which is risking therapy and safety. Now, what are the consequences of having higher IPAP? Well, it leads to increased air velocity, especially the nasal pillow cushion, discomfort and tolerance. That jetting in there, you know, is causing nasal symptoms. 
you got full face masks are being used more because of this jetting. People can't tolerate the nasal pillow like they could years ago. There's a more leak in mouth opening, we're gonna find out about in a minute. Abdominal distension and morning problems. Uh, you know, when you're jamming that air down the throat, I mean, down, down, the, down the throat, it's going into the lungs and into the esophagus, and it's gotta go somewhere. And then of course, I believe it's causing more treatment emergent central sleep apnea. It's causing more dry and humidification requirements because as you're jamming up that inspiratory flow, you're blowing most humidification out the exhaust. The patient's not getting it. And it's increasing the noise of the machine. So that's uh, all not good. So how could this happen? Well, not sure, but I think mainly for my, you know, interviewing everyone the last couple of years, there's just a large disconnect between PAP engineers, manufacturing executives, and sleep providers. All good people, all smart people, but they're just not communicating on the same waveform. Um, and, you know, this is what's led to this, you know, lack of understanding. The PAP engineers have told me, hey, I just go to the face. What's inside the nose and that, I, I don't go there. I'm not allowed there. That's not my area. That's yours. And, uh, and then with the manufacturing executives, it's not so much sleep physicians coming and tell them, hey, this is what we need. Hey, this will fix this with physiology. No, a lot of it's executives and marketing people going, hey, I think I can sell this. I think this will sell, let's make this. And they're doing their job, that's what they're hired to do. No one's wrong in any of this. It's just, there's a disconnect. There's also a perception that there's little science in mass selection or the PAP circuit. We think there is with a ventilator, but not with the CPAP, it's just a commodity again. Oh, give her five to 20 uh, centimeters and let her pick a max. And then over time, I think the biggest problem is us as sleep providers and home equipment companies, we, we just kind of trusted the manufacturers. We, we don't question them. We just think they got it all figured out and, and we don't look behind the curtain or under the hood. And, and so when I did a couple of years ago, I've, I've been quite surprised. Well, it gets even worse <laughs> because no one again is looking inside. You know, you see that red line, not very good. I'm not very good with this art stuff here, but, uh, you know, that's that's where they quit. That's where the engineers stop. They're gonna deliver that pressure no matter how hard you breathe in, they're gonna make sure you have 12 centimeters in that nares, uh, no matter how high that velocity gets going into your nose. But they don't understand the nasal resistance. And here's really the big thing, and we need to do another talk for a whole hour on nasal pillow mask, because a nasal pillow mask is a totally different mask, total different physiology, unlike any other mask, and it has to be totally understood and if you do, you can make it really great for patients and improve adherence. And if you don't, then you're not gonna, they're not going to like it. And that is a nasal pillow mask is a resistor. And so you're going to have a pressure drop across that on inspiration with the high flow. The nasal passage is a resistor. So you're going to have even another bigger pressure drop coming down here into the pharynx, right in here. Well, that's okay. It's inspiration. We've already shown that you don't really need that. All the inspiration is doing is making it more uncomfortable for new patients, particularly. Once they're used to it, it's not a problem. But here's what they're not considering. When you exhale, you have to exhale across that resistance. But what does it do? It does the same thing those nasal EPAP things do. It builds EPAP. It builds pressure. That's why even though the nasal pillow mass drop pressure so much on inhalation, they still need less pressure than a full face because of this buildup of EPAP. And so we can take advantage of that. We can let them build EPAP from lower inspiratory pressures. We, that way the machine, the fan's not blown as much, the noise is less, there's less drying, there's less exhaust, there's less dumping humidity, there's more comfort, there's less leak, there's less all those things in that list. And so, you know, that's what's interesting is that expiratory PAP that develops across the nasal resistance with a nasal mask and across the resistor with a nasal pillow mask that a full face doesn't have. And again, if you're titrating someone in the lab and you titrate them 17, you didn't use EPR and you used a nasal pillow mask and they go to the DME and they switch them to a full face and put them on EPR, you just drop them to 12. And 12 probably wasn't therapy for them. So what can we do now about it? Well, what we need to do is, you know, safely lower IPAP for comfort and reduce the complications associated with the high IPAP. And we need to preserve EPAP. We need to recognize that as clinicians, as sleep clinicians, respiratory therapists, sleep technicians and physicians and nurse practitioners, PAs, 
We need to own the PAP circuit and DME companies. We need to own the PAP circuit, not the manufacturers. They just make the equipment. We're the ones to put it on. We determine the dead space, the resistance, all those different factors. You know, if you're switching a Phillips mask or with a ResMed device, you're making all kinds of changes. Are you using a third party tube or, you know, using a 10 foot tube for this patient? You just change the resistance or switching around. If you don't enter it right into the machine, whether it's a 12 or 15, you've screwed it up again. And, and so we've got to, we've got to take responsibility and, and take control of that. And then we've got to find and use solutions to accomplish these goals, the lower IPAP and preserve EPAP. And so what we've done at SleepRes is the first thing we've released is the VCOM. It's an inspiratory comfort device. It's an accessory added to the PAP circuit to provide comfort. Uh, VCOM is currently makes no therapeutic claims, only comfort currently. That will likely be coming. It's registered as an FDA uh, class one device, just like tubing, filters, and chin strap. Does not require a prescription since the patient has a prescription for CPAP and its only indication is for CPAP or non-invasive ventilation. Think of it as training wheels for CPAP, just like a kid has to learn to balance himself on a bicycle. Well, as a CPAP patient, you gotta learn to resist that inspiratory pressure, trying to fill your lungs up and expand them with air. Uh, over time, a kid develops uh, um, balance and doesn't need the training wheels the same way with CPAP, people can adjust to this. But training wheels makes the kid ride the bike faster. And that's what VCOM does. It allows people to accommodate to this pressure much better by knocking down the inspiratory pressure. Therefore, we decrease the flow gradient and therefore we lower the flow and make it more comfortable. The VCOM goes between the mask, hose, and the tube. You know, on Dreamware, it goes up on top of the head unless you can plug it between the hose and the machine. It would work the same in either place. Uh, how does it work? Well, we've already talked about this. Uh, at high flow, during inspiration, there's a large pressure drop and that produces comfort. VCOM right now is the only way really, you know, to reduce IPAP. Well, I mean, you could manipulate the system in other ways, but, but you know, no ventilator, no BiPAP, no CPAP can lower IPAP below EPAP. None of they can in the world, current. We'll just leave you with that. Uh, <laughs> we filed a bunch of patents this year. Uh, the, the large flow creates large pressure drop in comfort during inspiration. During expiration, down here, there is low flow and therefore there's minimal pressure drop. Therefore, you don't drop EPAP, you preserve therapy and you preserve the exhaust so you protect against rebreathing. And the VCOM, if you look at this, has less resistance than other components. Look, these are the resistance curves of a 12 millimeter tube, the small nasal pillow cushion of a Nuance, a P10, and a Rio, the three main mass being used in the US nasal pillow, I guess besides Dreamer, Dreamer fits right in here. And then you look, you look at the VCOM, it's actually a little less because it's been engineered just to do the right thing. So what about our comfort data? Well, the first 53 patients, you know, we can only start this in May once we had it FDA registered because we were only using volunteers before. So the first 53 patients on it at setup, 89% felt more comfortable with the VCOM, 87% believed the VCOM would make them more adherent. Over 300 sleep providers experienced VCOM at APSS in June. The survey respondents, 92% believe it will help new patients. 96% believe it will help struggling patients. 96% believe everyone should just get one at set up just to make it easier. And 86% believe that it would decrease phone calls to theirs and the DME offices. Uh, using VCOM in our lab uh, during titration, the first 19, you can see as expected, as you increase the pressure, five to nine, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, the, the pressure change, the, what the VCOM required a little more pressure increases a little bit because you, as you get higher, higher pressures, you have higher exhaust flow and therefore you have more drop in pressure, more drop in EPAP. Of course, the maximum is only two out here. The other thing, you know, we did this quickly. We found that many of the patients were incompletely titrated before the VCOM was added. So it's probably a little less change in this. But look, the bottom line is if you're titrating someone in the lab, Put the VCOM in the circuit before or during titration. Then you know they're titrated accurately. And of course, the other thing this does, in all the VCOM data, is VCOM is lowering IPAP. I mean, it might be lowering EPAP a little bit here, but it's really lowering IPAP. And look, the therapy is minimally adjusted. Now, does VCOM affect auto algorithms? Well, not that we can find. And it may actually be improving therapy by decreasing the leak. So when we studied our auto algorithm evaluations, we had took patients who were only on 
who are averaging six hours a night, whether they were on a ResMed, Philips, or 3B machine, now React Health. And we gave them four nights without the VCOM, we recorded data, then four consecutive nights with the VCOM. And we compared either P90, P95 pressure, residual index, leak, and usage time. Now, I'm showing the ResMed data here just to make it faster. Uh, currently, the N is 45. We've got uh, another 60 out there who we're doing right now, getting more, because I want to look to see if a couple of these things become more uh, statistically significant. So basically, the AHI actually was a little lower, the, down, the residual, with the VCOM in, which I think is because of the de decreased leak. It's not quite statistically significant, but as the numbers go up, that might be. The P95 just doesn't change. So the, the VCOM is not changing their therapy. All right, now what's interesting is the leak is significant. It's 0 0.001, oh, they left the one off. It's already that significant with only 45, and the usage didn't change. So, so what's fascinating is it's not changing the therapy, it's not changing the titrated pressure, but it's decreasing the leak. And of these 45 patients, over half of them want to keep their VCOM, because we thought VCOM is just for new patients, but we're finding people who are already on PAP doing well, like the feel of it. Uh, particularly those who got decreased leak. We had one family physician who, you know, thought he felt much better than I see as a decon. In. So, and then of course we found it decreased noise <laughs> because, and so now a ton of their spouses are making them use a decon because it, it decreased the noise. And that's what happened to me, by the way, my mouth started coming open a few weeks ago. My wife overheard all this data and made me put one in. It did help my mouth stay closed at night, not during the day. But uh, now she's noticed the sounds less, so I'm with a VCOM for a long time. And again, the VCOM is lowering IPAC on all these patients, yet the therapy is unaffected. Uh, further evidence that IPAP's less important. You know, we're dropping IPAP everywhere, but it's not affecting therapy. Um, the other thing, and I'm going to go fast through here, just to be clear, you know, <laughs> one of our sleep techs, one of our head sleep techs, Carmen, she put it on a patient when they had their mouth open baseline in the end of May, and we had no idea, but it worked. So we just started a study. Well, now we've done 47 cases, and in 40 of them, it's resolved needing a chin strap. So 85% of the chin straps have been uh, avoided in our sleep labs the last two months. And you know, so dropping IPAP is improving mouth opening and leak. It's another reason to put the VCOM in for your titration, because then you don't have to go in when they're opening their mouth. Treatment emergent sleep apnea. I think I may just kind of go past this today because I don't want to make any therapeutic claim, but I just have to tell you, we believe we figured out what caused it. And we've had 14 consecutive cases that we've started using the VCOM to treat uh, TEXA and it's resolved all 14. Dr. Stroh Kingman says we have to keep going till we get a negative one because no one will believe us, but we're happy to show everyone our data and we're going to start having other labs, you know, try to verify this. But this is the most exciting thing to me because not only is it fixing it, it's, it, by fixing it, it's explaining that it's augmented tidal volumes that's causing it and not just leak gain. All right, uh, someone's asked us recently, a couple people like, uh, do we need manufacturer approval to use the VCOM? And we're like, well, that's not even applicable. Uh, the manufacturer is not gonna approve any device that they didn't make or did, don't sell. I mean, Philips is not gonna approve using a ResMed mask. Uh, that's just not gonna happen. Uh, they're not going to approve third-party hose, a third-party filter, so it's not really relative. Uh, the VCOM is registered FDA uh, device, class one, just like tubing and filters. I mean, do you ask for approval of those? Um, it, it, it's, it's really not an important part of, uh, of that. The clinician makes the decision of what goes into the circuit. Now, um, with that, in conclusion, what I have here is we as sleep providers need to provide the best care for our patients, whether in the lab or in the DME office or in the medical clinic, you know, even if we have to fight for it, they deserve what's right. Even if we have to, you know, do something different, we need to lower IPAC and preserve EPAC. Uh, we need to kind of reverse this ship. At sleep res, our sleep physicians, engineers, RPSGTs and RTs are working daily to create novel algorithms to increase comfort adherence, safety and effectiveness of treatment. We have a new AutoPAP algorithm we're working on. We have all kind of cool stuff that'll be coming out in the future. Uh, we say we don't really make CPAPs. We make CPAP use better is our plan. So we'll be sharing this with manufacturers and stuff because we just want to improve the field. That's the great thing about the VCOM. It's, it's Switzerland. It helps any manufacturer's machine, helps all the DMEs, helps the providers, and most importantly, it helps the patients. 
So the future is coming where sleep clinicians are gonna adjust resistance and flow of the mask and the system, uh, as well as pressure to better care for their patients. Like right now, if you if you have a patient who's having trouble exhaling and you want a mask with less resistance, if they're on lower pressures, if they're on higher pressures, you want a mask with more resistance. And we can go on and on. But for now, there's a quick, simple, safe, and inexpensive fix. And that's the VCOM. And I'll stop there for questions. That's fantastic, Dr. Noah. I can tell you, uh, I give a lot of webinars, so I know what it's like when you're speaking and it's crickets because we have everybody muted. I'll just tell you, there were a couple of times you made me laugh out loud and my little my little alert here said, um, in a good way, when you were telling your jokes about like your, <laughs> your mouth during the day and my little computer here said, you're muted, do you wanna unmute? So uh, very informative and, and easy to listen to as we go through. I uh, Obviously I have a lot to learn, but I, I learned a ton. So uh, we did get quite a few questions. First one that came in um, is, uh, as a physician reviewing data from a CPAP BiPAP download, what are some key areas that you focus on? Well, the first thing I focus on is probably not accurate. And if you read uh, <laughs> Robert Thomas's, you know, article in April, this year, uh, you know, I mean, let's see, the download index when they let the machine score it and then when they human score, but same data, I think it was difference was 12 uh, plus or minus eight. So it could vary as much the index of 20. And this reminds us of what we used to do. We had more in labs because, you know, we were having in lab data compared to a download index. You got to understand when you're looking at the download, it's like, the referee calling the basketball game, all right? Does the referee ever miss a call, okay? Well, he doesn't think he does, all right? Because he didn't see it. So he doesn't see it, he's not gonna call it. So it's the same with the downloads on these algorithms, all right? If I don't see an event, if I miss it, well, I'm not gonna raise the pressure, all right? Well, then I'm also, I'm not gonna, you know, score it as an event, so I just missed it. So it's so important to follow people clinically. And that's why we're working on these new algorithms. We need more data than just the airflow. You know, it, I mean, look at sleep clinicians, we spend our day trying to figure out, hey, is this right or not? And we tend to think, okay, it's less than five, it's fine, all right? Well, that may be if the patient's got improvement, they're doing better, yes. But, you know, I mean, look, we did a study with our own practice of a couple hundred patients a few years ago. We found a third of the downloads were low, a third of them were right, a third of them were high. But how do we know? So that's a real tough question. It's a real problem. And that's one of the solutions, you know, we're working to, to try to improve. And I, I totally get with the person who asked the question. Yeah, I, I can say, and I'm preaching to the choir on this, since I, I've come into the sleep field, I, got, I, I get conversations all the time. I got a phone call yesterday from somebody that I work with that was just diagnosed with sleep apnea, saying she's having a heart attack thinking about uh, her CPAP. She's claustrophobic. I, I can't imagine the pressure that you guys have trying to get this right for the patients. And I think it's outstanding um, that you're constantly questioning things and, 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 and figuring out ways to just do better for the patients. Everybody that I talk to in the field has that mind frame. It's fantastic. Next question. How you mentioned that no RX is needed for VCOM, but the packaging and website state RX only. Just confirming. Thanks for your help. You know, that's that person, whoever they are, we're going to send them something. Can't be yeah. far enough. That's a, that's a great <laughs> question. Thank you. Was that a plant? I mean, did one no, of my staff no, put right? that in there? I mean, you know, <laughs> so that's really funny because, you know, it's confusing. Our, when our, our FDA advisors and attorneys initially on the package told us, you know, well, you got to put that on the package. And then, you know, they went through later and we actually got another law firm with out of D.C. and and we need to take it off the package. Uh, it, it requires a prescription, okay? But the prescription is already in the CPAP. So VCOM has no other indication besides CPAP and non-invasive ventilation. And those both have to have a prescription. And it's an accessory to treatment. It doesn't have a therapeutic claim right now, okay? So with that in mind, if it's just like a, a hose, a filter, a chin strap, you, you don't have to do that. And you know, that's that that was kind of just miscommunication between all of us. So 
I'll just ignore that and thank you for that question. The new bags will not have that. Yeah, you got a lot of really great questions about the product. So some of them, um, we're gonna end up running out of time. So a lot of these, we'll make sure that we get a chance, Dr. Noah, for you to follow up with them um, afterwards. But some really great questions. Uh, another one, is it reusable? Yes, yes. Now we, as any piece, so now that it's been used, <laughs> We made it out of K resin, which is a softer type, you know, material that makes it seal better and it's easier to deal with. And uh, and if it drops, it won't break or if it gets pushed a little bit. Uh, but it's going to wear out, you know. So we're thinking it's going to have to be replaced now. We never thought about people using it long term. Okay, <laughs> we didn't know it was going to stop mouth opening. All right. <laughs> so, right. So you know, we're, we're gonna we're gonna start having the new package insert. We'll talk about. You need to replace it probably every three months. It depends how often you take it out and wash it. The more, you know, we have one guy who's washed it in every day and takes it out in and out of the system. And so that makes it wear more. So, but yeah, it obviously reusable has cleaning instruction. Now we say it's single patient multi-use, just like the mask and stuff. I know sleep labs, you know, tend to clean their mask and reuse them. I'm sure the VCOM will probably get used that way in the labs. Fantastic. You're getting lots of comments and compliments, doctor, so I'll make sure we send these, but one of them, congratulations for the great work and thank you so much. Um, another question, I've been trying to test out sleep strips recently. Lots of times with chin straps, I feel that it's a great effort, but I'm not confident patients given a choice at home will continue to use a chin strap despite it being effective. Does your sleep lab use these at all and have they been effective? So, um, Yes and no. Okay, so what we've really found that's revolutionary. I mean, that Carmen found my one of my sleep techs. I never thought of this. She is really bright. Let me just say it. She's been with us over 20 years. And yeah, we've got we have four techs that have been with us over 20 years. So, um, and uh, you know, I tell you what we're doing now. Same thing I did. My wife gave me. I'm someone's opened their mouth. We're giving them a VCOM because that IPAP's what's doing it. And if I knock IPAP down and I have to wear a gin strap, oh my gosh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, so I'm very happy for my own little device because my wife would probably have a chin strap on me right now uh, <laughs> recently. So so that's where I would start. As far as the, the strips and all that, you know, in clinic, people, you know, will, will give that as a recommendation. People will try it. Some like it, most don't. Uh, you know, most obviously no one likes the chin strap. I haven't heard anyone say, hey, I, I like chin straps. And yeah. uh, <laughs> so that's that's really promising that 85% of the, now it's just in the lab, you know, uh, but that that that's really encouraging. We're gonna do more trials and look at that in more detail. That's awesome. Okay, uh, a, a question of clarification on a, a piece that you went over. Could you again, quick explain the relationship between a ResMed device and a Philips mask and vice versa? Okay, all right. So this is why, you know, it's silly, the idea of asking a manufacturer, you know, whether right. they need approval for our for our device. It's like, well, you know, I mean, they're not gonna, now, now, you know, we have a couple of manufacturers talking to us about, you know, being involved heavily with this. I guarantee if they if they start selling it or something like that, well, they'll approve it then. Yeah. <laughs> but no one's gonna approve the other, but, you know, and then, and, and they're not going to, they'll, 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 they don't really want it to be sold, but I mean, Philips mask, particularly the larger cushions of a nasal pillow, have more resistance. In them. All right, uh, I'll, I'll show you guys something here real quick, just out of curiosity. So, can you all see my uh, my my whiteboard here? Uh, Dr. Heath was drawn on that earlier. Arguing over here in my lab, can you see? Yep, we can see it. Yeah, so over here in those boxes, with my wife yelling about, uh, <laughs> is every mask made in the world, pretty much. And then over there, there's my O2 tank, CO2 tank, lung simulators, um, flow meters, entitled CO2, and every machine, oh, you see a bunch of machines there too. Yeah, I've got every pack pretty much made in the world, every mask, and we test all of them. And that's what I started doing oh, about two years ago. I just, I always let my respiratory therapists and sleep techs make that decision. And I finally got into it and started asking questions like, how do you make that decision? And I quickly found out there was really no science into it. So we began looking at all this. and And so, so like a Phillips mask, like a Nuance, or uh, has more resistance in the nasal cushion. So at high pressures, it's more comfortable. I was showing the then head of all their engineering last about a year ago this and took them a month to finally 
try it. But yeah, I mean, if you compare it to a P10, it's more comfortable at higher pressures because it's got more resistance in the cushion. So it's doing kind of what the, a little bit of what the VCOM is doing, all right? Um, but at low pressures, well now, you know, you're having trouble exhaling, you may not want that resistance in the mask. But in general, if you, if you have a Philips mask with a ResMed device, you're gonna drop, uh, you're gonna drop the inspiratory pressure, okay? And that's what it is. But guess what? You're gonna increase the expiratory pressure when it crosses back over on a nasal pillow. And we've got to learn to think that way. We've got to start understanding what this equipment does instead of just handing it to patients like I'm guilty. Look, I did it for 28 years. I just handed out, said, oh yeah, well here, wear this. And, and the reason our outcomes and our adherence was you know, so much higher in the, in the studies was mostly behavioral. And the other thing was, it was several years old. It took a few years to get it published. So, um, you know, the machines probably were a little softer then. The other thing is we use more nasal pillows than others. And so that might have been part of the difference in, in that result. But, but yes, uh, the full face mask, well, then it varies because if you, <laughs> if you have like Dreamwear, uh, well, then, you know, you're going to have the extra dead space in here. And it gets really complicated. And I, I, think, I think that would be another seminar that we need to do to go to everyone. But I really appreciate who's asking that, that they're really wanting to make changes and make the best for their patient, because that's the person I want. That's where we all need to go as clinicians. And we're gonna put all this information out. We're gonna try to educate everyone so they can know this and they can take the best care of their patients. That's fantastic. That's a great wrap too. So Dr. Noah, thank you so much. It's always fun to listen to you and listen to the way that you're challenging the way we think about things and super excited about everything that you're doing, um, keeping patient care in mind. So that's fantastic. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. And listen, thank InsoData so much for, for doing this and for providing these educational seminars for the field. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Noah. Thanks, everybody.